Good morning and thanks for joining our Bible study today. This is a weekly teaching ministry of Faith Baptist Church South Metro and my name is Paul. We are studying uh, a series on Elijah and we are in 1 Kings chapter 18. And today we're going to take up, uh, well, well, we're going to review first uh, a few verses and then going to take up verse 30. Uh, today I'm going to talk about altars. Uh, the significance of uh, Elijah repairing the altars as well as the significance of Elijah uh, telling the people to come near to him. That's our topic for today. Lots of uh, insights and principles from the Word of God. But before we do so, let's bow our heads and uh, close our eyes. Let's go to the Lord in prayer and seek divine uh, enlightenment, uh, divine understanding of His Word. Remember that the filling of the Holy Spirit enables us to assimilate and understand and grow spiritually. It's the Holy Spirit who is the real teacher of the Word of God. Let us pray. Our dear Heavenly Father, we thank you that uh, we can once again go into your Word, your message to us, and be blessed and grow spiritually from it and make application in our life today i pray that god the holy spirit may challenge us for the things that we study today in jesus name amen so elijah was a believer in the lord jesus christ and he was a prophet remember that and he lived during the period of great apostasy in uh, the nation israel uh, when king ahab and jezebel uh, ruled that nation and because of the apostasy of the nation just a, bit, a little bit of a background and the total rejection of the Word of God by the Jews at this time um, indicated, of course, by their idolatry, by the worship of Baal, God sent punishment to the whole nation in the form of economic depression, uh, which was, there was a drought, no rain for three and a half years. And the people suffered anguish, uh, no food for the people, for the, for the animals, their businesses were down. They were being disciplined by God. and God removed their economic prosperity at that time. And so here's a principle I want to remind you about. God blesses or punishes a nation based on the attitude of believers toward the Word of God in that nation. God blesses or punishes a nation on the basis of the attitude of Christians in that nation about the word of god if a nation uh, uh, the believer in a nation rejects god he rejects his plan rejects his word then god will certainly discipline that nation that's the story of the israelites so therefore god's blessing on the nation is dependent upon the believers who establish god's word as their number one priority and they grow to spiritual maturity that's a principle you want your, nations, your nation to be blessed, you got to grow. Because God blesses those who have capacity. And we're not just talking about material blessings, of course, but uh, blessing by association. When you, when, when you grow in the Lord, and God blesses your life, and God blesses everything around you. Uh, those associated with you, including your nation. And so here we see in the story of Elijah, there was a pivot. There was a group. There was a remnant of 7,000 believers who were growing spiritually, and that turned the tide for the nation. So the contest at Mount Carmel was an opportunity, really, as we said, for the believers who were in apostasy to recover. God gave them a chance, and, and this contest will, will uh, demonstrate the power of God, and they will wake up to their apostasy and degeneracy and they will uh, recover so as a review let's go to the point one the contest begins uh, with Baal prophets performing the rituals first we look at that last Sunday after all day of their praying pleading shouting dancing religious dance and cutting themselves with swords there was no voice there was no answer there was no response Okay, let's read that passage of Scripture just for us to review. 
Okay, verse 25, let's begin there. And Elijah said unto the prophets of Baal, once again, Choose you one bullock for yourselves, and dress it first. For ye are many, and call on the name of your gods. But put no fire under. And they took uh, the bullock, which was given them, and they dressed it, and called on the name of Baal from morning even until noon, saying, O Baal, hear us. But there was no voice, nor any that answered. And they leaped upon the altar which was made. In other words, they danced. This is a religious dance. And it came to pass at noon that Elijah mocked them and said, Cry aloud, for he is a god. Either he is talking, or he is pursuing, or he is in a journey. Or perhaps he sleeps and must be awaked. Verse 28, And they cried out and cut themselves after their manner with knives and lancets till blood gushed out upon them. And it came to pass, verse 29, when midday was past, and they prophesied until the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice, that there was neither voice, nor any answer, nor any to answer, nor any that regarded or paid attention. Okay, Satan himself has no power to start a fire. We saw that. No fire. All day praying, no fire. Because Satan himself cannot produce fire. So we saw last week that religion is futile. It's useless. It's a failure when it comes to relationship with God. It cannot give you eternal life. Religion cannot give you meaning to your life or purpose for your life or happiness in your life. Only the Lord Jesus Christ can do that. Because the Bible says in John 14, 6, Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except by me. John 10.10, 10, the Bible says, I have come. Jesus said, I have come that you might have life. And that you might have it more abundantly. Religion cannot provide you that. Religion cannot give you eternal life. Religion cannot give you abundant life. Maybe some of you, my friends, you've been living with that religion for all your life. Are you sure because if you have that religion, are you sure that you're going to heaven? Are you sure that that religion has given you eternal life? That when you die, you will go straight to heaven to live with God forever? Does your religion give you purpose every day? A meaning to your life? Or does, does your religion give you true happiness? You know, I doubt it. You, you must rethink about your religion. And maybe focus on the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so we, we saw also that idols are inanimate, uh, man-made, made with human hands. And the Bible describes idols as a nothing. You know the Baal statues, the Baal idols, the Jews made them, Ahab made them with their hands. Inanimate. And the Bible says they are nothing. Isaiah 44, 9 and 10 and 1 Corinthians 8, 4. We can find out later. So religion is always the work of man, but it is sponsored by Satan. Religion is how Satan, uh, you know, deviates the mind of people from the truth of the gospel of Christ. In contrast, however, Christianity, Christianity is not a religion, folks. Christianity is a relationship with God through the saving work of Christ on the cross of Calvary. He died for you, and the only way you can have relationship with God is to appropriate His work on the, on the cross on your behalf by faith. Because in Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, the Bible says, I repeat, keep repeating this verse because it's very important, for by grace you have been saved through faith. And that not of yourself. In other words, it's not you doing it. Not of works. Lest any man should boast. Religion boasts of its works. Man boasts of his religion and he, the works of religion. But that's not the way to God. That's not the way to eternal life. Only Christ can save you. And faith in Him, believing in Him, can save you. Now, let's go to this lesson today. Uh, point number two, 
and your lesson. This is now Elijah's turn to show the power of the true God of Israel. Okay, let's look at, uh, and you can find it in the uh, beginning in verse 30 and up to uh, uh, 39. Okay, that is the account of, of Elijah's, um, uh, you know, setting up the altar and putting the sacrifice, putting water and God eventually uh, sending far from heaven. But this morning, I just want to study one verse, okay? <clears throat> just study one verse today. It's, in, it's, it's verse 30. So, again, remember, a, a whole day, no fire from heaven for the Baal prophets. But in verse 30, it's now Elijah's turn. Let's read the word of God. And Elijah said unto all the people, and Elijah said to all the people, Come near unto me. Come near unto me. And all the people came near to him. And he repaired the altar of the Lord that was broken down. Okay, let's, saw, let's see the actions and the significance of what Elijah did. The first thing Elijah did was to talk or communicate to people. Okay, let's go to the lesson. Point number one, he addressed the people first and asked them to come closer to him. Okay, he's standing there. There's so many people, probably thousands, and the first thing Elijah says, come near, come near me. Come closer. You know, the Baal prophets did not do this. When they started their rituals, they did not regard the people. They did not talk to the people. They just went on to perform their ritual. Because, folks, religion in reality does not really care for people. Your religion does not really care for you. Religion, because religion is always a taker, not a giver. Religion will take your money. Religion will take your time, your efforts, your energy. But religion is never a giver. It's always a taker. Okay, that's the principle I got from there, from that passage. Number two, the people responded to the words of Elijah. So when Elijah says, come near, the people responded. The people responded to Elijah. And you know, maybe you're listening today and and and. and there's some feeling inside of you that says, I have been in this religion for a long time. Some of my friends listening there, I know there are many of my friends are listening here in the industry that I'm in. And I know you have religion, right? But just try to be honest with yourself. Maybe religion is not helping you. Maybe religion does not give you your religion does not give you assurance of a relationship with God. When you realize that your religion is futile or useless, then it's time for you to turn to something that is true, truth. And that is the Bible, and that is the message of the Bible, and that is the message of the gospel. Jesus Christ dying for your sins. And so here in the story, the people responded to the words of Elijah. See, and I see a principle here. The first step to spiritual recovery is the communication of the word. The prophet or the pastor or teacher must teach and people must respond to the communication or the teaching. This is how this whole thing is going to turn around. Elijah beginning to communicate, to speak, and the people begins to respond. Okay, that's a good sign. There is no recovery in any, from any spiritual failure in our life if we don't go back to the communication of the Word. And today, we don't see a prophet. We have the Word of God. We have a pastor, teacher, and we have this book right here, the Bible. We need to go back, you know, and listen to Bible teaching. Learn the Word of God. That is the key. So they responded. Point number three, the phrase, the phrase, come near to me in the Hebrew. I studied this a little bit. 
is nagash, which means to draw near, to approach, or to join oneself to someone or to something. To join. So it is used extensively in the Old Testament, this word. It's translated said, okay, used to say. But let's give one example here. One use is of the priest approaching God. In the book of Exodus 19, uh, verse 22, the Bible says, And let the priests also, which come near to the Lord, that's the same word, nagash, come near means nagash, to the Lord, sanctify themselves or set themselves apart or consecrate themselves, lest the Lord break forth or break out upon them. So, that's interesting use of the word nagash. Okay, it's the priest approaching God. They need to be sanctified. They need to be in fellowship with God. They need to be right with God. They must approach God with no unconfessed sin. Okay, that's why I told you there was a brazen labor in the altar because they need to wash. That's a symbol of them uh, confessing their sins and being in fellowship when they start to worship. They start to serve the Lord. Point B, the word also nagash is in the imperative mood. The word imperative means it is a command. It's a command. So, this is Elijah who possessed delegated authority from God. Now, let's talk about authority for a while. Yeah, I mean, if it was a command, Elijah didn't say, Please, please, please come here, you people, come here. Please. It was a command. Okay? It was given with, it was said with authority. Because it's in the imperative. Now, <clears throat> let's look at some points here. Number one, the gift of pastor teacher, which is the spiritual gift that is valid today. The gift of evangelist, evangelist, pastor, teacher. There are no prophets today. There are no priests today. Because it was Old Test Testament. There were prophets and priests. But today we have the completed canon of Scripture. And the Bible says in Ephesians chapter 4 that God gives the gift of pastor, teacher in the church age. The job of the pastor is to study and teach and communicate the gospel and other truths from the Word of God to people. And God gives the gift to uh, certain male believers for that. Now, let's go back here. Point one, the, pa the gift of pastor teacher carries authority. And thus, he must communicate with authority the word of God. If you have the gift of pastor teacher, you have authority from God. and you must. But you must study and dig deeper and be faithful so that you can teach with authority. You know, before, many years ago, there was some concept of, you know, cell and, and group Bible studies. And, you know, there are new believers, there are new Christians, and they attend. And the leader would say, okay, there's a verse there. What can you say about the verse? Oh, can you explain this verse? What can you say? But there are new believers. They don't know anything yet about the Word of God. And so, folks, to me, I stick with what the Bible says. There is a gift of pastor teacher. The job of the pastor is to dig the word of God, maybe verse by verse, and communicate to people. That's the design of God. The entire word of God needs to be taught to people so that they can grow. But that requires authority. See, I'm talking about authority. There's no substitute for somebody spending hours and hours and hours of time in studying and teaching it with authority that this is the word of God. And, the, and of course, the communicator is always responsible to God for uh, his teaching, to make sure that he sticks with what the Bible says. The pastor teacher must dig the Word of God and study faithfully under the filling of the Spirit, so that when he teaches, he does so with authority. And that's the principle. Number three, the pastor teacher's authority, however, does not extend to interfering with the personal lives and the privacy of people. So. Many times this happens as well. Uh, the, the, there's abuse of authority by, um, uh, by certain pastors, okay? They cannot encroach, or they should not, must not, 
encroach on the personal lives of the members. You know, they cannot choose what color of car you need, you buy or which house you need to buy. Now, if you ask your pastor some advice, that's okay. But the pastor has no authority to dictate you what you should do in your personal life, in your personal things like that. No? So, you, so understand that. Understand that. The authority of the pastor lies in teaching, okay? In the local church. In teaching the Word of God and, and make sure that the congregation grows spiritually from that, from that teaching. And the pastor is responsible to God for how he uses his authority. Don't worry about the pastor abusing his authority. God can handle the pastor and he is unsurable to the pastor. So, I just want to point that out because of the imperative mode. I, 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 you know, I got an insight that, wow, Elijah had authority when he said, come near here. He commanded the people, you come closer. Come closer, approach. Why? Why did he say that? Okay, point C. The Jews needed to be near to be able to listen, <clears throat> see, and observe. Kung malayo sila, they could not see, right? They, or they could not hear. What Elijah was doing or what he's saying in, 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 the, in, in Mount Carmel, where he was. He was about to perform, uh, you know, the sacrifice, the burnt offering, and they need to be closer to see. Now, I was thinking about this. I got some insights, and let's make some, a, few, a few applications here, okay? First of all, you have to be near someone who is truly teaching the Word. You have to find someone who is teaching the Word that you grow from spiritually. Now, of course, fellowship in the church is okay. Social life. Sometimes we stay in a ministry because of those considerations. It's good. Okay, we need fellowship. We need loyalty. But if you stick with a, with a ministry and you know in your heart that you are not growing spiritually, it's time to pray to the Lord. Okay? So it's time to get access to a certain uh, teaching that is systematic and that allows you to grow consistently and regularly and and you have a good feeding from the word of god um so the point here you have to be near someone who is truly teaching the word of god faithfully and from whom you can mature spiritually and become a productive believer okay number two drawing near or closer also implies focus and concentration on the teaching i think that's a good insight because when you go near, you can focus and you can concentrate and you can see here. In the case of Elijah, he's going to perform the Old Testament rituals of the burnt offering, uh, which were designed to teach about the person and the work of Christ. He is about to perform these rituals and it's going to be a picture of the Lord Jesus Christ, the sacrifice. And people need to see. Because in the Old Testament, people learn by rituals. They have no completed Bible. Okay? Limited yung uh, written word. That's why they need to have a ritual. Like the sacrifices. Uh, the offering of the animals. The altars, which, was, which we shall see in a while. So it's designed to teach about the person and the work of Christ on the cross. You can't draw near to teaching <laughs> just once in a while. By the way, just once in a while, you got to have regular teaching, regular exposure to Bible truth, and Bible doctrine, and Bible teaching if you want to grow spiritually. You have to have sustained focus from the feeling of the Spirit and not a hurried or haphazard quiet time. You know, sometimes we're so busy. Just in the morning, we just read one verse. Blah, 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 and then pray, Lord, thank you. The best this day. I mean, five minutes, ten minutes. And then we jump. I don't think that's the way God designed for us to grow spiritually and focus on Him. Well, 
I don't have to talk about the time you spend some, on something else. But why is it that when it comes to our spiritual growth, we put as little time as possible, haphazard time even. We're in a hurry because we need to do something. But we just waste our time in many things, okay? Now, point number four, let's see here. Growing near or approaching also denotes connection, see? And this is always the problem with communicators because like right now, the other day I was I was doing a webinar, a leadership webinar for, for, uh, for, for an organization. And it's difficult to connect with people online like this. Okay? The, when, 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 you, when you show your PowerPoint, you can no longer see their faces. There's no interaction. So it's difficult to connect. But when people are near, you, they, they, you know, they are close proximity. You can talk to them. You can look them in the eye. And then you, you can connect. So I think that's what Elijah was saying. Come near so he, he could connect. Elijah connected with the people so they could re so that the people could reconnect to their spiritual life once again. The worship of Jehovah through the ritual of sacrifice. So Elijah wanted them to see what he would he would do in order for them to reconnect with their spiritual life. Remember, they have been worshiping Baal. They have forgot. In fact, the altar is already broken, and Elijah need to repair first the altar the fact that it was broken nobody has been there kagaya minsan ng spiritual life natin the altar of our spiritual life is broken we have neglected it it shows neglect or we don't pray we don't spend time meditating on the word of god our altar is broken and so elijah Come near. So he tries to connect with the people and he tried to connect the people with the activity that will remind them that, hey, you've been away too long. Hey, you've not read your Bible for so many months and years. Hey, you have not been listening to good Bible teaching. You've not meditated on the Word of God. That, that, that's what Elijah was doing. He tried to connect the people. With the activity that should change their thinking. B. Jesus is the ultimate example of a great communicator who connected with people at all levels of people. When he was talking with, for example, fishermen, he talked about fish. When he talked with farmers, he talked about the seed and all that. You, you know, Jesus Christ could connect with anybody. He's an expert. He's our model for communication. He can connect with everybody. And uh, I think this is a good point. So, come near me. You need to be closer to someone who can provide you teaching the content of the Word of God upon which you can grow every single day consistently, okay, faithfully. Let's look at the second action of Elijah. It's very interesting. Second action of Elijah. He repaired the altar of the Lord. Okay, point B. He repaired. So the first one, he called the people to come near him. The next, the, the, the next one, he repaired the altar. What's the significance of this? Let's study. Point one. Altars in the Old Testament is a place of slaughter or sacrifice. Okay? That's what it is. It's a place of slaughter. They kill the animal. When you see an altar, you... When a Jew sees an altar, he, he, he knows that's a place of killing the animal and offering the animal to the Lord. From the very beginning, it pictured and taught the sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ on the cross. Jesus Christ was taught thoroughly, extensively in the Old Testament through sacrifices. Therefore, the altar is designed to teach occupation with Jesus Christ it's designed to teach occupation with Christ and love for Christ and focus on Christ alone the celebrity of Christianity is Jesus Christ and he's the only one worthy of praise 
and worship. To the altar is always a place of worship, a place of praise, gratitude. Now, gratitude is very important. Thanking God, expressing your, your thankfulness to God for who and what He is in your life. And it's gonna, it should be a constant thing in our life. Fellowship with God and communion with God. That's what the altar means. It was a symbol or an indication of the Old Testament believers growing spiritual life. Of course, Abraham existed before Moses. And during the time of Moses, God instituted a, a, a system of worship for the whole nation. That includes the tabernacle where all the sacrifices were made in order to teach the, the, the people, the whole uh, nation of Israel. But during the time of Abraham, the altar already existed. The system of worship already existed. So, when there is an altar in the Old Testament, it always is a sign of a healthy spiritual life of a believer where he spends time regularly and every day. In fact, there is a morning sacrifice and an evening sacrifice, as we shall see in a while. Why? That's how regular or how consistent believers should be in terms of their communion with God, and learning of God, and worship of God. And on a daily basis. Daily basis. Now, let's look at Abraham as an example. Very interesting. Uh, when, when you talk of altars, the first, the first uh, accounts here in the Bible of altars, of course, is is Abraham. Let's look at him. The significance. Let's read uh, Genesis 12, 6 to 8. Genesis 12, 6 to 8. The Bible says, And Abraham passed through the land and to the place of Shechem, Shechem, actually Shechem, and to the plain of Morah. And the Canaanite was then in the land. Verse 7. And the Lord appeared unto Abraham and said, and to thy seed I will give this land. And there builded he an altar unto the Lord who appeared unto him. Now what's the significance of this altar? Number one, he built an altar in Shechem after God had made <clears throat> a promise that his descendants will have a land. So we could say this was an altar of praise and worship. You know, if you study uh, in Genesis, the book of Genesis, God promised Abraham a piece of land for his descendants. It's called the Palestinian covenant in which it's an unconditional covenant and it will be fulfilled in the future. It's not being fulfilled now. But the Jews will have a land, okay, big land in Palestine. And this was promised to Abraham. And it's interesting that he said here, Abraham built an altar unto the Lord. So, actually, this God promised already Abraham that, and God reminded him that I give I give land to your descendant. And after that, you see, it's a blessing. Eh? Abraham created an altar to praise God and thank God for that blessing. Do you stop to think about God and thank God every time you receive a blessing from Him? Or we just take the blessing and run? Sometimes we just pray, pray, pray and pray for things, for provision from God. And when God gives, we never, we never even give a thought to God. Once we have in our hands the blessing, we just run without a thought about God and thanking God. But here is a good example. Abraham built an altar and he thanked God and he praised God and he worshiped God. Also, Abraham built an altar in Bethel, which is an altar prayer. Okay, let's, let's, let's see that. He called on the name of the Lord. Mm -hmm. 
verse 8, And he removed from thence unto a mountain on the east of Bethel, verse 8, and pitched his tent, having Bethel on the west, and Hei he, he, he on the east. And there he builded, okay, old, old English, builded or built an altar unto the Lord and called upon the name of the Lord. This is an altar of prayer. He called on the name of the Lord. Is prayer a regular part of our spiritual life? That's the question. That's the application. So the third altar he built was after separation from Lot. Remember the story of Lot and Abraham? That when Abraham yielded to Lot and became generous to Lot and says, "Okay, you can take the uh, you know fertile uh, land, you know the nice land filled with grass." It's interesting. Abraham also built an altar there. Let's read Genesis 13, verses 14 to 18. And the Lord said to Abraham, after that Lot was separated from him. You see, when Abraham decided, okay, Lot, go get the best part of the land, immediately God came to Abraham. And the Lord said to Abraham, after that Lot was separated from him, lift up now your eyes. And look from the place where you are, north, northward, southward, and eastward, and westward, for all the land which you see, to thee I will give it, and to thy seed forever. Wow! What's this piece of land that Lot got? Sodom and Gomorrah, right? God tells Abraham, don't be petty, don't... don't but look at that. I'm going to give you a land that will, you, will have, you will have it and your seed will have it forever. And I will make your seed as the dust of the earth. So that if a man can number the dust of the earth, then shall thy seed also be numbered. Wow. <clears throat> Arise, walk through the land in the length of it and in the breadth of it. For I will give it to thee. Lahat na inaapakan mo, puntahan mo. It's yours. Verse 18, Then Abraham removed his tent and came and dwelt in the plain of Mamre, which is in Hebron. By the way, the word Mamre and Hebron are interesting. It means fellowship with God. Okay? Worship. And he built there an altar unto the Lord. So I think this is an altar of peace. He was at peace after he gave the benefit and, and, and he yielded to Lot. He was at peace. And God came to him. And again, it's a, it's a place of gratitude and praise and worship. Even though somebody else took advantage of you, just thank God. Because God can give you more. Of course, God can give you more. Okay? More blessings. And that, and, and and the fact that he created an altar there shows that he he was occupied with the Lord. Abraham was not occupied with piece of land. It's nothing to him, folks. Can we make an application here? We are so focused on the things that we see that we forget about the invisible God who is at work in our life every single time, the whole time. The whole time that we don't think of God, that we forget about God, He looks at us and guides us and protects us and gives us everything that we need. The things that we worry about, these little things, that little thing, the things that we missed, the blessings that we missed, you know, the deal that we missed, the business deals that we lost, the job that we lost. Hey, begin thinking about God who works His hand in our life and definitely can provide us more that's the lesson i got here from this altar here the fourth altar is found in genesis 22 9 to 14 let's read it this is the most important altar i think <laughs> that abraham built because god 
Ano, Abraham was now a mature believer and, in the, and his test belongs to a mature believer. Can you imagine God telling Abraham, bring your son and kill him? Okay? Cut his throat and offer him as a sacrifice for me. In the beginning, God told, you know, I got this boy when I was 100. You said I'm going to have descendants, you know, as the dust of the earth. But you will kill him? But you see, Abraham sees the one who is invisible. You have to be focused on the invisible God. On the reality of the invisible God. Because if you only look at the material things, the material life, the people, you will never perceive the will of God, the plan of God, the purpose of God. But here, here, let's go back to the test. Go there, Abraham, Mount Moriah. Bring your son. Bring wood. You have a knife. Okay, go there. Abraham just follows. So let's look at the account. And the Lord said to Abraham after, uh, sorry, and, uh, verse, uh, verse 9 in uh, Genesis 22, the Bible says, And they came to the place which God had told him of. See, he has to follow and go to the place where God uh, told him to go. And Abraham built an altar there, and there laid a wood in order. By the way, I like this phraseology of the, phraseology of the Bible. In Elijah's time, Elijah also laid wood in order. And he, in the beginning, that's the, that's the procedure. Elijah, uh, Abraham laid the wood in order. Organize it. And he bound Isaac, his son. He tied him up. And laid him on the altar upon the wood. Can you just imagine this boy, maybe already a teen teenager, tied, placed on the altar with wood. And you know, the next step is, of course, to kill. Remember? Animal, there has to be blood when you offer sacrifice to God because it represented the blood of Christ. You have to kill the animal. And here's a person, his own son, lying there in the altar. And he was about to kill him. In obedience to God's test, to God's word, to God's command. And we, and verse 10, and Abraham stretched forth his hand and took the knife to slay his son. When he was about to do it, an angel of the Lord, this is Jesus Christ, called unto him out of heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, here I am. And he said, Lay not thine hand upon the lad, neither do thou anything unto him. For now I know that thou fearest God. The word fear means respect, love. It's awe. It's reverence to God. That's the word fear. It's a synonym for occupation with Christ, God. Loving God. Seeing that thou hast not withheld thy son, thine only son, from me. You know, this verse reminds me of the verse in, in Romans 8, 32, 31, 32. God did not spare His own Son. You know, God did not spare His Son. He gave it to us, Him to us on the cross, Jesus Christ. But, verse 13, And Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, behind him a ram caught in a thicket by his thorns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered him up, for a burnt offering in the stead or as a substitute as a substitute for his son and Abraham called the name of that place Jehovah Jireh as it is said to this day in the mount of the Lord it shall be seen so he built an altar of provision at a time when God tested him to offer his son Isaac Mount Moriah means where the Lord provides or where the Lord appears. That's the meaning of the word. So folks, God's, the altar, the altar of provision. God provides at the right time, the right place. The right stuff he provides for us and number four here today there are no more physical altars did you realize that we are not required by god to set up altars or burn animal burn animals right now it's not part of the system no, no more 
the real altar resides in the soul of the believer, your soul and my soul, where true worship, fellowship with God, praise of God occurs. Bible doctrine or Bible truth learned, or metabolized, and applied in our life form the basis for worship. You cannot worship on an empty soul. You cannot worship God with an empty soul. If your soul is empty of His Word, of His truth, of His doctrines, of His precepts, you cannot worship God. Remember that. Let's go to the word repair. It's very interesting as well. It means to heal or to mend, to restore. And it's very significant because when Elijah repaired the altar in Mount Carmel, it communicated God's grace in healing the nation and restoring believers back to himself. Elijah gathered the people. Elijah repaired the altar. Folks, something is about to happen with this group of people. They are about to turn their backs from Baal, from idolatry, from reversionism, from apostasy, from degeneracy. They are about to do that. And it, here it begins with closeness, with listening, with looking at the sacrifices and the altar. When the Jews would see the altar, immediately their mind would remember God, the true God of Israel. And Elijah repairs the altar. Healing is about to come. And rain is about to come to the nation. I hope you learned something today from the altar in the Old Testament. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the lesson we learned today, how important it is to walk with you, to worship you every single day, to learn of you, to love you, to give everything to you, whatever we have in our own lives. Thank you for the significance of this altar. And in our soul, may we continue to feed our souls with your word so that we can build an altar of praise in our souls and walk with you day by day with gratitude of heart and love for you, Lord. Challenge us with this message today in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks for watching. See you next week.